Kinetics is the next part that we're going to go on to, and uh, kinetics is all about speeds of reactions. In this portion, we will talk about the rate of reaction. So the first thing you have to think about in kinetics is why do we study kinetics? And we study kinetics to study the rates of reactions, which is actually the speed of reaction. But then the thing is, why do we need to know the speed of reaction? Well, we study the speed of reaction so that we can make them go faster, or slower if need be um, and unless you understand how a reaction is taking place you will never understand um, how to make it go faster or slower um, also in kinetics we we talk about uh, the process okay the mechanism as to how the reaction is taking place and at what temperature is the optimum um, reaction so there are so many more things that go into kinetics than just studying the speed of the reaction. So it's like one of the biggest fields for chemistry because it's really important to understand how reactions work. Um, it also helps us to minimize some of the undesired reactions. So if you don't want a product, well, maybe there is a certain temperature at which if you work, then you can minimize those products. So that also comes from studying um, how reactions work. So all of these are really important parts of um, kinetics. How do we actually use these things? Of course, in drug design, um, and drug industry is one of the biggest industry out there, but however, uh, that's not just the only thing. Any kind of a chemical process is uh, going to benefit from study of kinetics. And then, of course, in understanding how reactions work, for example, in enzymes, you know, which is in our body. So we understand a lot of our own body processes as well. So what is the rate of reaction then? The rate of reaction can be measured as either the disappearance of the reactant or appearance of the product. Okay, so if something is disappearing, it's going to be negative. If something is appearing, it's going to be positive. So for example, if you have an equation, simple equation, A going to B, it doesn't matter what A is and what B is, A is the uh, reactant, B is the product. So then the rate is going to be designated as minus of the change of the concentration of A over time. These signs over here, of course, if you remember, these are delta signs. And delta signs here, these triangles, they indicate change. So there's the change of concentration over time. And for A, which is a reactant, is going to be negative because it's disappearing. And for B, it's going to be positive because it's appearing. And again, we can measure B also, which would be then the change of concentration of B over time. So uh, then if we look at the graph of this, obviously, uh, for B, it should be increasing. For A, it should be decreasing over time. How do we monitor the rate of reaction? Now, there are many ways that you can actually monitor the, way, uh, the rates of reactions. The most rudimentary kind, like the one that we can do in lab and actually see it, is either by gas evolution. So if you see bubbles coming out, we can measure that. You can look at precipitate formation, okay, something visual, okay, that will give you an idea that reaction is taking place. Color change is the most obvious one, and this is the one that you will do in your lab also. And so color change is like the best one to do um, in a lab setting. And here is an example also of that reaction. So for example, if uh, bromine is reacting with formic acid, and don't worry about what these are, but in any case, if it's reacting, then the bromine, which is supposed to be a dark reddish colored liquid, over time, it's going to disappear because in the product, you don't have any bromine in there. You have bromide ions, but not bromine as a liquid. So in that case, by the time your reaction is all done, you should have absolutely no color in it, okay? Whereas initially you had the red color. So uh, disappearance of color or appearance of color change, whatever it is. And then if you have a change in pH, you can look at that also. Um, nowadays, we can also use some instruments to figure out uh, the rate of reactions, but these are some of the visual kinds. And then we have something which is called the average rate of reaction. An average rate of reaction is when you have a reaction that you started at time zero and then by the time it finished. Okay, so for example, here in seconds, um, the concentration of bromine is disappearing. Okay, and so here you can see that the concentration is 0 0.012. And then by the time you get over here, this is uh, 0 0.00296, a very, very small concentration left. So it will almost be colorless at this point. Okay, the solution is the same reaction that we were seeing in the previous slide. So from time, which is in seconds, going from zero to about 400 seconds, the bromine has decolorized pretty much. And so what you're looking at here then as 
at intervals of time 50 50 50 we are measuring the concentration okay as time is going by and so the rate at 0 is 4.20 and then the rate at uh, 400 is 1.04 and you can see looking at the rate of reactions here also that we've calculated the rate is the highest when the reactant is the highest concentration by the time the reactant is almost getting over the rate also is going very slow which is pretty normal to think about because if you don't have any reactants then how would you have any reaction uh, but anyhow, to calculate the average rate of reaction, you would just take the final concentration of bromine and subtract the initial and then uh, subtract the times also. So, for example, you can take at any uh, difference okay, of the rates and then you can find the uh, average rate. The rate that you will find over here at from 0 to 50 is also called the initial rate of reaction. And this is initial because this is happening like as soon as you mix the reagents. By the time you get here, the reactants are very less, okay, because you've started forming the product. So maybe the rate here is going to be very slow. So if you wanted to find out the average rate of reaction in the entirety, then you would go from zero to 400. So here you would have 400 minus zero, and then you'll get the true average rate of reaction. The, if you calculate these two from zero to 50 and 350 to 400, you will see a slight difference, okay, in the rate of reaction. Obviously, initially, it should be much faster than the at the end. So calculate um, the average rate of formation of oxygen in the following reaction. And here is just an example okay, of uh, what we just talked in the previous slide. So the time is given to us from 1,200 seconds to 1,800. And then, of course, um, the concentrations are given to us. Okay, And so this should be an easy calculation to do. Um, all you have to do is subtract the two concentrations and divide it by the change in the time. And that will give you your final answer. Okay, so this is going to be the average rate. So keep it simple. There's nothing to get complicated about over here. So the concentrations and the time, both are given to us. <clears throat> so another example here, and this is a bit more conceptual. And as I've always said in class also, if your concepts are clear, then everything else is going to be clear for you. So shown here is the plot of concentration of a reactant D versus time. So here is the concentration of D, um, and then time is over here. How do the instantaneous rates at point A and B compare? So here is A and here is B, and this is the concentration of D, don't forget. Is the rate for this reaction constant in all points? So first of all, let's look at A and B, okay, and compare the rates. So do you think they are the same? No. The slope at point A is going to be greater than the slope at point B. You can see that it's almost trailing off into a straight line. And that is because at point A, the concentration of D, which is the reactant, is very high. Okay, And so uh, the reaction rate that's happening over here is way higher than the reaction rate happening at point B. So then the rate, the rate constant for all points? Well, obviously not then, okay? Because if it was, then it would be a linear graph, okay? But it's not a linear graph. It's actually a little bit of a curve, okay? And so uh, this is a little bit conceptual, just to give you an idea how concentration changes over time. And then we have something which is called stoichiometry and rate of reaction, how we can never, ever, ever forget about stoichiometry. So... When the stoichiometric ratios are not 1 is to 1, then the rate of reaction is expressed as follows. So here's the general equation, okay? And we use, in kinetics and equilibrium, you will see that we use hypothetical reagents all the time. A, B, and products would be C, D, okay? So don't worry about those things. The thing is that you're talking about reactants and products. So if you have A and B giving you C and D, and small a, small b here, these are the coefficients of the reaction, then the rate that we have, okay, is this is how we can compute it, okay, which means that, remember, the rate was delta A and the change of concentration over change of time. So that still remains the same. And since A is the reactant, that negative sign also remains the same because it is disappearing over time. So here are both the reactants with the disappearance. The only difference here that you see if the mole ratio is not 1 is to 1, 
that you also have to divide with the coefficient, okay, over here. So for everything you have to divide with the coefficient. So with the C and D, which is the appearance of the products, so the appearance are, are positives, but you still have the coefficients over here. So uh, the way you use all of these things is, of course, if you know the concentration of one, you can predict the concentration of the other, provided you have a balanced equation, okay? And so um, that's what we can do. So here is a problem for us, okay? Peroxidized sulfate ion oxidizes iodide ion to triiodide ion, which is I3 minus, and the reaction is given to us. How is the rate of reaction that is expressed as the rate of formation of the iodide ion, the triiodide ion? related to the rate of iodide ion. So here is the iodide ion, and here is the triiodide ion. So all we have to do is relate it like this. Now remember, the iodide ion is the reactant, so it will be like this, and the triiodide would be the product kind, okay? And so this is the triiodide, and the triiodide is right here, and there's only one mole of it, so nothing goes down there. Whereas in case of the iodide ion, you have to have three down there. What does that really mean for us when you think about it? Is that when three moles of the iodide ion react, then you get only one mole of triiodide. So that is what this fraction here kind of indicates. So here is another example for stoichiometry. Okay, so here is a reaction for pH3 to give you uh, phosphorus and hydrogen gas. If the molecular hydrogen formed at a rate of 0 0.168 moles per second, uh, molarity per second, at what rate is P4 being produced? So hydrogen right here is being produced at 0 0.168. So what is the rate of P4? Now remember, this is a mole ratio of 1 is to 6. So you have to think about when 6 moles of hydrogens are formed, that's when only one mole of phosphorus is formed. So if you get that concept in your mind, then you don't have to do great calculations, okay? So again, let me say that again. Once you form six moles of hydrogen, then you form only one mole of phosphorus. So whatever concentration you have of hydrogen, that's going to be six times more than of phosphorus, okay? Which means that phosphorus is one-sixth concentration of hydrogen. The ratio of phosphorus to pH 3 is 1 is to 4. So by the time 4 of the pH 3 disappear, you only get one mole of the phosphorus. Okay, so those kind of relationships, if you can relate to those, then your calculations become a lot easier. So uh, the solution here, okay, first of all, all of these relationships are, relationships are given to you. So minus one over four of the phos uh, phospor uh, phosphorane, and then the phosphorus here and the hydrogen here, okay? What we need, of course, is the relationship between these two. We don't care about the pH three. So uh, the concentration of P4 is going to be one sixth that of the hydrogen, okay? That really is what we're saying. So 0 0.028 molarity per second. That is going to be the concentration of phosphorus formed. If you have 0 0.028 concentration of phosphorus, four times that would be of pH three. If you were to find out how it was disappearing, four times this number would be the disappearance rate of pH three, okay? So that's the relationship between all of this. This is what stoichiometry tells us. So mole ratios, again, are very important for us. So in this very short uh, little presentation, all we did was the rate of reactions and the stoichiometric uh, relationships. In the next one, we'll go on to do the order of reactions. Okay, so I try to make this small, uh, so we do it in small pieces.